Hello, welcome back to Railway Mania. Today we're joined by Will Stratford, who's been working as a garden signaller at the Festinian and Welsh Highland Railway for a year now, but you were volunteering before that. Yeah, so I started about um, seven years ago in um, the loco sheds, and then um, tried out gardening as a trial, and I absolutely loved it, so I started as a guard about three years ago. And you've been working full-time recently? So for the past year, I've been working full-time in operations. Well, in the summer and then in the winter, I was part of the engineering team at DINAS. I think a lot of people don't know that you can work full-time for a steam railway, and to many it must seem like a dream come true. I was kind of always interested in railways, but my parents handed me a leaflet one day and said, you need to get out of the house more. I didn't realise you could volunteer until my parents told me and showed me a leaflet, and it all kind of all went from there. <laughs> and which railway was that? That was the uh, mid Hans Railway, the Watercrest Line. So that was local to you? Yes, yeah, pretty much next door. So. You're currently working at the Festin York and Welsh Island Railways. What is your job role there? So at the moment, I'm a, a, technically a member of the Ops Department, so that's um, guarding, signalman, I'm a crossing keeper, and also a trainee controller. So initially, it was a mate of mine in college. He said he got a couple of weeks' work experience up there and said, did I want to come with? So fair enough, um, go and have a look around. And we spent uh, two weeks there, absolutely loved it from that, and then uh, came back the next year and year after. I was doing uh, loco side for the first kind of couple of years visiting. And then um, someone suggested trying kind of a three-day trial, which is the basic of how do you get into operations. I tried that and absolutely loved it. So you started w- as a cleaner? Yeah, cleaner in Boston Lodge. It was just go around cleaning engines. When I started my operations trial, they essentially take you out on the train for three days. It was a complete new side of stuff I'd never seen before, so I thought, yeah, I'll go for this. It's quite a change from quite a grubby job to one where you actually have to be quite clean and customer Yeah, facing. yeah, it's, uh, my, my girlfriend loves it. My fingernails had not been so clean. Yeah. <laughs> what drew you to this particular job then? Initially, I'd always wanted to do a paid kind of contract. We have mainly volunteers, but a core team of staff to help us run trains. And we have some people we bring on in the summer for the high busy period where we really tend to struggle with volunteers because, well, everyone's on holiday. So I wanted to get into that one and it was coming to the end of um, my time at uni down in Bristol. So I thought, well, I'll go for a contract while I can sort out a proper job. And a year later, I've just about managed to sort one. Heritage railway work is often quite seasonal. So what did you do in your downtime? Uh, Most of the time it was just really exploring Wales. It was an absolutely stunning landscape I've never actually seen before. And then I did something really stupid and bought a drone and started making videos on that. So that kept me pretty occupied. So could you take us through your various job roles and just explain what a typical day would be like for this? So my main one at the moment is a guard. We start um, a few hours before the first train departs, so that can be anything from half six in the morning to half two in the afternoon, depending on which shift you're on. Uh, you go around, you prep the train, essentially make sure it's coupled, it's safe, uh, give it a clean as well. You set out your reservation boards, so they'll give you a list of how many parties you can have. So we occasionally have a, a cruise ship that comes along, Viking cruises, they bring 100 people, which is brilliant fun trying to fit into a, a tiny train. Underway, uh, going through the train, making sure on the passenger side, we're checking tickets, making sure everyone's going to the right place. And also we're in charge of safety. And so that could be anything as small as um, make sure the doors are locked or shut, leaving the station, to uh, God forbid if the train catches fire, we're the ones who have to deal with it. So it's a, sort of a swings and roundabouts, but most of the time it's making sure the passengers are happy. Right, so this is a very customer-facing role? Yes. And you have to be quite friendly. Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> to uh, everyone, whoever, even if they don't want to be friendly back occasionally. <laughs> and what about the other roles you've been doing? I'm a signalman at Port Maddock and a Kai Pau crossing keeper. Okay, tell us about the crossing keeper first. Kai Pau is an interesting one. We're actually, the, as far as I know, we're the only narrow gauge railway or heritage railway as such that crosses the national network. So to do that, we have to essentially be interlinked with their signalling system. And the way it works, they're based on uh, ERTMS, which is essentially in-cab signalling. We have to somehow interlock with that. So the way it works is the signalman will actively send us a release to activate our panel and unlock our signals. We send our train across and send the release back. And it, it's pretty simple unless something goes wrong. So I had one shift a few weeks ago where there were some signal and telegraph uh, people on the network rail side um, fiddling around at Port Maddox station. And um, it started setting off all the emergency alarms on our side and then also caused a power cut. So it was absolutely fine until that happened and then you have to go into what's called graded mode, which essentially means a lot more talking to the signalers at McComfliffe and flagging, locking points, clamping them, that kind of thing. So it's, a, it's good fun. At least it was a sunny day on that one. Um, and this is a crossing that's on the level. There's no bridges or anything else. It's like- no, we literally go straight across the network rail. It makes a hell of a clank. <laughs> and um, the track is... It's weird, um, we have quite 
well, sort of heavy gauge track for narrow gauge, but then we have to go up to kind of network rail standard gauge track or standard kind of weight. And so it looks really weird when you walk down there for the first time because you see this absolutely heavy base track, which is for trains that weigh about 300 tonnes or more, just for a garret and a few coaches. But mind you, garrets are fairly large themselves. Uh, to be fair, yeah, as, as navigation engine goes, garrets are pretty substantial. Although but... seeing a quarry huns let go over the crossing is quite something. Yeah, it is quite sweet, to be fair. And the Sigmund at Port Maddox, that's just gone through a remodelling. Yes, about um, a few years ago, we, we started off with just one platform, which is what you can see in all the heritage pictures. And then it was fine until we started running the Welsh Highland into it as well, because the Welsh Highland comes from the other direction. So initially the procedure was for a train leaving the platform, you'd have to be piloted out, Garrett couples on the back, give the right away, and off you go to Carnarvon, and then reverse in the back. That was fine until you needed to get a Festinial train roughly in at the same time as well because you would always have to shunt one train out the way. So they owned up, went to remodelling to create uh, another platform. So essentially now we kind of, you go around the first curve and it goes on for a lovely long straight. So you've got the Welsh Highland platform on one side and a Festinial on the other. Since they did the remodelling at Port Maddox, what's changed from the signalling point of view? Uh, the main thing is we have a lot more signals and a lot more track and a lot more flexibility. Initially, it used to be uh, just a five-lever ground frame, if I remember rightly. I only ever had one play on it when I was um, doing Boston Lodge before I even considered ops. So yeah, we just have a lot more now. Instead of the big kind of mechanical levers that you see in quite a few heritage boxes, we have uh, small miniature ones, so um, electromechanically ones. Now we've got a 12-lever panel, which we pinched from Darlington, I believe or a bit of it. There's a picture still in the box of the old panel, and I think it's about a hundred lever frame, and uh, we managed to get a few levers out of it. Now we have a lot more flexibility, we can take a lot more capacity, we can take a Welsh Highland train in at the same time as Festinog, while having something shunting around in the yard, something going for water, so we we can do a lot more now. The levers themselves are also, um, quite a few of them are multifunctioned. So the points one they will only do one set of points, but the signals associated with it can all be done with one lever, like um, when you come into Port Maddock from Blind Festiniog, the first thing you'll see is the Trident, which essentially is a big, big post on the outer Port Maddock with three signals on top. Uh, that's all controlled with one lever, and that's intelligent enough. It can only pull off a certain signal depending on where the road's set, and it's always the same lever. So it's just a lot more flexibility, and also they managed to make it quite ergonomic as well. It's strange because it looks like a main line signal, something I'd expect to see on a standard gauge railway because it's so large. Yes, yeah. They also, instead of the standard main line where you have a white bulb at the back um, and the lens has been changing, it shows red normally and then it will show um, green when you pull the signal off. And the lens actually has quite a neat little trick. If the signal for some reason, the bulb behind it will show green, you won't be able to see it through the red lens. Yes, it feels They've got it on light. different frequencies, so yeah, it will just look like a normal light, which is quite a cool trick I only found out about a few months ago. But. In terms of your role at Port Maddock, then, what's the signalman there responsible for? Because you've got trains approaching from the north and east. Yes, so um, from Carnarvon and Blyna, uh, normally at the same time. So the signalman controls everything that a passenger train will run over. So I will control pretty much everything except for the yard, which is all hand points. To get across Britannia Bridge, we have an acceptance switch in the box. So we can essentially control which way the train can go. To actually activate the crossing, there's a key on the end of the um, token for that section and they'll twiddle that in a box either side of the um, crossing and that will activate the crossing. From the Festiniog side it's a little simpler we just pull a few levers and the train can come in. The crossing over the road is not like a normal crossing, the, the train actually has to go down the road, it's quite an undertaking. Initially the line left Port of Maddox, it went over the bridge and a bit further along to where uh, what is now a shell garage, it then veered off to the right to go down to Carnarvon as part of the Croydon tramway straight across what is now the car park. As a sort of compromise, I, um, the people who initially rebuilt it um, said, if we go just hug the side of a car park, can we swap bits of land? And it was a win-win. But yes, we do literally have to go straight towards cars, which is always good fun when you have a traffic jam. I had one train, I think it was a few days ago, where um, I gave the right away. I wait for the train to go. I hop in, in the back coach and start walking down. I'm thinking, we're going quite slowly now. There's a lot of whistling, look out the side. Ah, there's a boat on a crossing, that's why. They must have been quite surprised to see you. I imagine they must have been terrified. <laughs> it's always good um, watching people's reactions when we have um, events on, like uh, quirks and curiosities. And um, there's one which actually was a bench which had a motor in it. And it had six people sitting on it, and this is about, if you want to visualise it, it's about half the size of a standard picnic bench. 
on wheels. Uh, so a crossing goes off, people are going, oh, what, what's this delay? And they see this bench just fly off in front of them with three people sitting on there. In, um, I think it was from France as well, so they had the kind of French gendarme uniforms. <laughs> and uh, that was absolutely hilarious to watch. <laughs> Flying bench. Pretty much, yeah. Oh. And is that the only signal box on the line? Uh, no, there's one more at uh, Rugoch, which is about halfway between Minford and Tannerbolg. Only reason it was there, really, was when... Uh, the line was first built. It was horses pulling gravity trains up. So at some strategic points, you needed a place to change them. So there was a place to um, essentially a makeshift stables. It was where you can swap in a new horse and send them up. To get the horses back down, you'd get them um, on a, their own special cart and stick them on the back of a gravity train and send them away. Well, that's really interesting because I think a lot of people assumed that the same horse set would pull the trains up to the, from one end of the line to the other, but they changed them along the way. Yeah, yeah, to say their horse's legs falling off. But <laughs> yeah. but I believe it was about every three miles, you'd have one stable at uh, Boston Lodge, where they'd go down the port and then start going up. Then you'd have uh, one at Rugoch, or Havrachlin, which is uh, just the Port Maddox side of Tannerbolg. And um, I, there must be more further up, but I can't actually think of where they are. <laughs> Well, they've long gone now. Oh, yes, yeah. There's not much revenants. Have a clean, essentially. It's just, it looks like there used to be a signing bed, and you see a little well for where they used to have the water. You really get an idea of how much difference having locomotives introduced to a previously horse and gravity worked railway was. When you think about each horse set, well, was it a single horse per train? I depended on the size of the train. I think it was a single horse. So, and that could only travel three miles? Normally, yes, to get kind of maximum efficiency out of them. And, and one locomotive could pull a train all the way from port all the way to Blyna? Oh, yes. So when the um, England engines came along, they were quite a revolution. The Rugoch signal box, what's different about that to the one at Port Maddox? It's partly the area it controls, but also it's your kind of, when you think of a signal box, it's your traditional big lever frame. Most of the time it's uh, switched out. So if you're a tra- passenger travelling through, you'll notice there's green lights coming up and coming back down. It's just automatically there. Uh, on busy days, we can actually um, open out as a box and split the section in two. So accept trains through. I've only ever had to play with it um, once. When I was in my time at Boston Lodge, we had to go and rescue a failed engine uh, as a P-way train. So I had to open up the box as a ground train more than anything else. So the signal's all locked to red and uh, lock the train in and send it back out. But yes, it essentially, it's your big lever box. And also it's in the middle of nowhere. There's a beautiful view. And yep, if you can get a Rugox there, you are having a good day. What about the other stations on the line? Because you have a lot of passing places and a lot of sections between stations. How has that worked? Quite a few of our stations. On the Welsh Highland side, uh, they're mostly done through um, damped and weighted points. So as soon as the train comes over, the points will revert to their normal position. A little white light will come on at the indicator to show it's locked. At Minford and Tannerbolg, they're uh, automatically operated. When a train strikes in or activates the track circuit, it will set the road in if there's um, the pass clear. Our system is quite interesting. It doesn't allow simultaneous arrivals because of the overlaps. An overlap essentially is a space allocated beyond a red signal to allow a driver to miss it or just not just stop in time. That's normally done by setting the road out slightly as well. Uh, obviously not ideal if you want to use the same set of points to take a train in. Uh, so striking in, assuming there's no other train arriving in the station, uh, striking in will set the road in. Uh, once you're in, you put the old token in into the first token machine, you take a new token out of the second machine, and that will activate the points and set the road out. So the automatic system would hold a train that was due to arrive at the same time and wait for you to complete that motion? It works by uh, a train striking in. Um, from the signal box on thing, you'll hear a bell sound. Uh, or actually, if it's at Tannerbolg, uh, the person who programmed it had obviously loved Monty Python. So if it's in one direction, it goes, Nyeh! and if it gets going in the down direction, it goes, no. And it's quite nice to have an audible signal to know where your train is. But if they strike in at the same time, it, the train that strikes in first will get priority. It will set the road in. Once the train has come to a stop, it will then set the road in for the other train. Like a hefty piece of engineering. It's interesting at times. So we had one itch- issue where... Um, taking the token out, it was, wouldn't activate the signal. Um, I was up in control at that point, and we could see on our panel when a route is called, or when a road is set, and it wasn't being set. So, okay, we told them to put it back in, try it again, because essentially it works on contacts within the system. We tried again, didn't work, so we had to wind points, which is fine, uh, but you have to get someone to go and reset them. Because obviously you've got a train coming down from the other direction, and as soon as you start winding points, it disconnects from the system as a safety measure. On big lever frame, pulling a lever for a point, will essentially pull a load of rods and the rods will pull the point across. If you've got motored points, essentially it's a little motor that spins around and pushes the points across. If that motor fails, then you have to get those points across somehow and you haven't got a lever to pull. So what you have is a winding handle. You put the handle in, wind it around a fair few times and that motion will essentially act as the motor and push the points across. The issue is, 
you need to a ensure the points are locked if you've got a facing move for if so if you're sending a passenger train over a facing set of points so going towards it you need to have a point lock in there by law you also need to ensure that it's disconnected it's not going to move so the act of actually winding the points the motor says i'm not in use now and it will disconnect itself and then S and C have to come along and be uh, connected. And sort of law, it always happens on events. Always happens on events. But you know you've done a good job when no one notices. Yes, it's one of those things. Like if it's not going wrong and it's all behaving itself, no one will notice it's even there. Pretty much, yes. It's quite nice. Said, oh, it's been such a smooth journey. I'm running up and down, as covered in sweat because I've been winding points, flagging trains, and what have you, because everything's gone wrong. But as long as they enjoy themselves, as long as they feel like they've enjoyed themselves. The worst thing you can say is when you're at a station for a while, uh, for example at uh, Tanabok, where we stop on the way up to Blyna State Water, because you got, no matter how many times you reassure them, saying, oh, it's just for a few minutes, we're just taking water, they think they're going to miss their connection kind of thing. And then they're miraculously surprised when we actually still get there on time. They're quite different operations. The, the Welsh Line Railway is one of the longest in the UK. Yes. Yeah. Round trip of about five hours, I think? Uh, yeah, two and a quarter hours each way. Wow. Um, and the Festinog is one of the oldest operating railways in the UK. It has many more, well, for a start, it has more stations than the Welsh Highlands. Uh, not necessarily. It's about roughly on the same par. There's um, the Welsh Highland. You've got, uh, I don't know, Beth Gillett, Ridley, Whitefower, Dinas, Carnarvon. You've got, 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 you've got five main stations. And then you've got uh, quite a few halts as well, which, some of which are in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, that makes sense because it's so long that they're really far apart from each other. I think that gives the impression of them being fewer stations. To be fair, on a standard journey, you will only stop at about a few stations. And we do that because they're, they're the popular stations. And also that's where and we have to exchange tokens. So we have to stop there anyway. But it's, it's the same with Tvestiniog. If you go on one of our trains there, we actually only advertise stopping at Minfuth and Tanabolch. But you've got... Uh, Boston Lodge, Penmin, the Act, Tanagrutia, uh, Campbell's got a eye, Plas Holt, you've got loads. From an operations side, or from your job, especially as a guard, what are the differences in working the two lines? Mostly it's a stock, so the Welsh Highland side is uh, a lot bigger, a lot more spacious, which is brilliant if you're a tall bugger like me. I've been walking into a few coaches and said, oh, good morning, folks, can I see your tickets? And <laughs> hit my head on the roof. Only happens on the vintage set, that one. The main one is we have two different systems that operate, so... On Heritage Railways, you have a token system to kind of ensure that you're not going to meet another train coming the other way. On the Festinog, we have tokens. On the Welsh Highland, we have staff and ticket. Essentially, it's a more primitive version. We are upgrading into token systems. The main difference operation is when you take a token out, let's say at uh, Mimfa for Tanabol, it's actually interlocked with the signals. So the act of taking the token out machine will set the road out and you now you have it. On the Welsh Highland, we have a slightly more basic version. There's some stations where there's a key on the end of a token, which you twiddle in the box and activates a signal. There's somewhere uh, it doesn't have that. So at every single station, you have to actually read the token to make sure it is the right one. In terms of an average day, how many round trips do you do on the Festinog? You'll do two on the Festinog on most turns, and you'll only do one on the Welsh Highland because it is such a long way. Which one is more intensive to work? Uh, the Bat Reader Festinog, mainly because each station is about either 10 or 20 minutes apart. So you need to get through a lot quicker? Yes. You're saying that the, the stock is a different size on the Festinog because of the loading gauge difference? Yes. Does that have an effect on what kind of facilities you can have on the train? Yes and no. So all our trains will have the basic. They will always have a toilet somewhere in the guards van, which is always handy for the parents with small kids. We do a basic kind of buffet service on the Festinio of kind of um, drinks, slight refreshments. And um, on the Welsh Highland, we actually have a full kitchen. So you can get um, a toasty jack potato. Last year we were doing pies, curries, you name it. Which is always quite handy, especially when um, you're a guard and you've forgotten your lunch. I was quite surprised when I went on the Welsh Island recently that the, I didn't actually realise before that they were running corridor stock. So it's like a main line train. Yes, pretty much. So we can walk through up and down the train. Uh, it's mainly for uh, the buffer crew, so they can do their stuff. It's quite handy that the guard can get through as well. We do, um, on most of our sets, have an old heritage Welsh Highland of what it used to be like, normally at the back of the train. And that essentially is a compartment. They used to have gas lights, took that out for obvious reasons. And so, yeah, we've got quite a nice mix. We've had some people that had one guy who came from uh, America just to go on our line. And he wanted to do the observation car on the way out and the um, heritage compartments on the way back just to get... Uh, well, he said the best of both worlds, but um, I know where I'd rather be sitting. Well, the observation car is... A Pullman carriage. Yes, it is. It's very luxurious. Has amazing views at the back. It's absolutely wonderful. And we're also building another one. It's just about to be painted. Oh, wow. Excellent. And that'll be brilliant because we'll have aircon as well. So is that the fourth one now? Fourth uh, one? Yes. Well, fourth new build, observation car. When I went on, my favourite part of the journey was actually the open carriage. Because I'm strange and I like getting a face full of smuts. How popular does that prove usually? 
on a hot day it's normally rammed in there uh, i don't blame him to be honest uh, it's weird actually on on wet days as well you get some proper hardcore fans in there i can't understand it to be honest what kind of mix of passengers do you get on the two railways most of our lines it's um tourist passengers so the way um, most of our marketing stuff works is by selling the view because it well yes it's absolutely stunning there so on a welsh island you can go up and see well the bottom of snowden uh on a festinio we get once again it's mainly tourists um we get a lot more hardcore fans on that side because of the history behind it and um, mainly because we've run double engines and so um we've actually got a patent so only we can make um double fairlies now Oh yeah, because Ellie granted the license to the Festinio. Yes. That's episode two of Railway Mania, if you've heard that. <laughs> Going back to the staffing arrangements, what is the usual split on an average day between volunteers and staff? It depends on how many volunteers are available. We essentially have a core team of paid staff who can fill in where volunteers aren't required, or where volunteers aren't there. So most of the time, um, a volunteer will email and say, I'm going to be down for X period, can you put me on the roster? So we'll work around them. And yeah, as paid staff, that's why I'm qualified in quite a few things, so I can fill around the gaps. The paid staff will often be sort of multi-skilled? Where possible, yes. Yeah. So the way we start, you start as a trainee guard, go up to a guard, and then you'll be kind of um, trained up on Kai Power and Signal Box. And then once you've got all of that, then you'll be trained up as a controller, if there's space available. And, and how many staff are usually kept on an average day? On our quiet day, we'll have about three. On our busiest day, we'll have ooh, about... 10 to 15. The permanent staff are really essential to this operation? Yes. Both railways are obviously operated as a business. It needs to operate every day of its timetabled workings. So it really there is, you can't have a margin for error really? Not really. It's, we do have quite a few facilities if a train can't run for example. Um, We essentially have a giant toy box of engines and for example um, one of our double engines, uh, Mervyn Embus, is currently out of action uh, temporarily. So we just got them in ladies, Linda and Blanche, and that's covering the service. If we do have to cancel a train mid-journey, our booking office team will arrange transport or to get them to another station. And so we really do try and work around every single possible issue. Are there any memorable incidents you can think of? I did have one. It was on um, uh, Quirks and Curiosities Gala, and we had an interesting fault with one of our engines. We had a visiting engine which didn't have a vacuum ejector. So by our rules, um, they cannot go on a Welsh Island Railway. Now, to get around this, and we double-head it or top-and-tail it with another engine that does have a vacuum injector, so essentially um, the visiting engine would have a dump valve, so you can still control the brakes. But the engine providing the braking uh, developed an interesting fault where one injector would work, one injector wouldn't. And that was fine if the balance pipe wasn't blocked. So we had one injector that wouldn't work that did have water, and one injector that would work that didn't have water. Uh, we had to fail it at one of our stations, uh, dump out the fire, have a call about 10 minutes later another engine came down on the back and off we went and it was like having a nice little toy box it was wonderful <laughs> best railway in the world <laughs> <laughs> to deal with that kind of situation obviously you have to get the staffing right well the busiest times seem to be galas do you tend to get a more of an influx of volunteers for those events most of the time yes mainly because um galas it's just different so um most quite a few guards they like guarding um the vintage sets mainly because you have a lovely guard time with balcony so it's absolutely brilliant fun especially if you've got a lovely vintage guards uniform like yours yes yeah very dapper why do many railways not have this permanent core of staff then um well quite a few of them do but mainly in the engineering side but a lot of the time it's because they have volunteers and we're quite fortunate okay we do have a fair few volunteers but at the same time we are in the middle of nowhere and we do have a lot to run so for example um, most of our permanent way in s and people most of them are paid staff mainly because you've got 40 miles of rail. And you have to go out in all weathers. Oh, yes. And But we did actually have one kind of device to make our permanent way issues easier. Uh, we actually have our own tamper, a smaller version of the one you'll find on network rail. So it does make life a little bit easier, but at the same time, you still need the men to run it. And 40 miles is a lot. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's a lot of infrastructure. <laughs> that leads me on to another thing, because, like you say, it is out in the top left-hand corner of Wales. Do you find that a lot of the st- summer staff are there for seasonal work, or are they more permanent and live nearby? Most of the time it's seasonal work. We're quite fortunate the railway actually built its own hostel. Well, we actually have two, one at Minford and one at Penmin. So if you're a volunteer, you can get a few nights for pennies. If you're actually doing work, and that's a, quite a nice deal. We have some people there who kind of hop between seasonal contracts. So in the summer, they'll be doing operational stuff. And in the winter, they'll be doing something like um, carriage works, painting and building carriages. So we have a, a nice mix. 
for yourself, did you end up relocating your home or did you opt to live in the temporary accommodation? Uh, it was temporary accommodation. So I started off in a hostel um, when my plan was only to be there for a few months and then it sort of suddenly got extended. A mate of mine um, bought a house and had been renovating it for the last few years and he'd finished it. So me and a few other mates moved into it. Okay. Obviously paying him for the privilege, but it was quite nice, especially when um, hostels are absolutely brilliant. And if you come to the railway, it's definitely the best way to get to know everyone. But once you've been there for a few months, after a while, it's quite nice to have a place to yourself. Is there an emphasis on employing paid staff in the more public-facing roles? Is it harder to recruit volunteers for pub- public-facing roles? It literally depends on the people. The way to get into the local side is you start at Boston Lodge as a cleaner and work up. The way to get into the public side, the operations side, is you start on train as a buffet steward. Uh, most of that allows you to learn how, sort of how we operate and also um, learn the route. And then from there, you go on to a guarding trial. So... I wouldn't say it's challenging, it just depends what people want. Most people say, oh, we'll go to a railway, I want, I want to actually drive a steam engine. That's certainly been my experience of volunteers. I've, I found that a lot of people who are on their first day, a lot of them will say, I don't really want to work with the public, I want to do the engineering side of things, because that's what draws them to it, which is fair enough. I was um, the same when I started, to be fair, but yeah. yeah. It's only until I tried out guarding on a three-day trial, I realised, actually, this is really good fun. Okay, great. So it was positive for you then? Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. That, that is something that I found is quite hard to recruit for, is people who are good with the public. Did you find that the railway looks for those kind of people? We do it in a variety of ways. So um, the main one is Kids Training Week, or sorry, uh, Young Volunteers Training Week, it's called this year. Um, that's actually going on at the moment. It started yesterday. We bring in prospective new young volunteers, and they do a variety of tasks. So it could be sometimes uh, painting the carriage works, working with infrastructure, working with permanent way, and stuff like that and hopefully that recruits quite a few people for example quite a few other volunteers started because of kids training week and it's always brilliant watching their facebook memories pop up and see their little face <laughs> so often you'll hear stories of people want to turn up on their first day and they want to drive a steam engine straight away it's a common one yeah most of the time we, we can say kind of um this is what you have to do first and most people will be able to learn but you get some people think i'm just going to come here for a few days and then drive a steam engine it doesn't really work like that but that's kind of one in a few mm. This may well be your final summer season. Yeah, I've only got a few weeks left. And you're moving on. Where are you going next? I'll be going to uh, Network Rail as a signaller. Uh, that'll be based down in uh, Didcot and uh, Thames Valley Signalling Centre. Did you find that the experience you've had working on Heritage Railways has helped you in ap- applying for this new career path? Yeah, it's always, it's always good experience. I mean, um, as part of the application process, they'll ask you 50 questions about stuff you've experienced. And it's things like... Um, spads dealing with cancelling trains and i think that probably helped quite a lot but yeah it was just one way into it is this a usual career path quite a few we found of our paid seasonal stuff they've gone on to do something within the railway so we've got a couple of people that are guards have gone on to that um some people have gone on to be uh, train drivers after going up through guard and some have um, become controllers partly based on their experience at the festinio uh, it's a mix of reasons quite a few companies know that we run to quite a high standard our rule book is pretty thick like theirs it's kind of we are we are a proper railway and we run as we should it's occasionally some people <laughs> on facebook they'll see a picture of um let's say our lovely new observation glass going oh, that's not very heritage and then someone will go off into a fantastic rant about how the railway pretty much never stopped since 1832 so yeah yeah it's um technically speaking it's also run as a top the festival new railway company is a top so it just makes it that little bit more modern at the same time. Yeah, I mean, it's got to exist in an environment that's quite competitive. Yes. Well, we have a nice mix of um, tourists and um, people who come here just to see the engine and the history side of it. But also, um, we're in sort of a semi-ideal place. We get quite a lot of cruise ships occasionally, which is, as I said, it's always good fun when you have 100 people. They do book on, but it's trying to get them all on the train when they arrive five minutes before departure. It's always a fun one. So there's a lot of competition with other attractions around the place. Like I say, there are five steam railways within the local vicinity. Yes, and there's about, um, uh, I think it's about 13 narrow gauge railways in Wales. Yeah. Um, most of those are up in the north side of it. Yeah. With exception things like um, the Vale of Rydal and Brecon, which are more southerly. But... So when you're looking at the average tourist market, they'll be looking to go to one railway. So it, it, it's quite hard to stay ahead in that field or to try and attract people who might think, well, I'll do one railway this summer. I won't do another one. So most of it we're trying to, 
I chat to him saying, hey, we've got this, we've got this. So, yeah, we've got um, garrets brought over from South Africa hauling about 100 ton trains up through the beautiful world countryside or historic double fairlies that have the strongest navigations you can find for its side and stuff like that. But, yeah, most of the time we are selling things like the view as well. And also, compared to quite a few heritage railways or um, navigator ones, we've got quite modern carriages because we're building them to, not necessarily an old standard, we're building them to our standard. The only constraints, really, is the loading gauge. And so our new kind of super saloons, as they're called, they're the biggest they can possibly get now because you've got, in some places, uh, six inches clearance on each side, which is brilliant. This is why we have the sign saying, don't stick your head out the window. Here we go. Here's a, here's a really basic question. What was your favourite part about working on the railway? Ooh, I think it was the first time when I got passed out. And it's just quite nice walking down the train and saying, this is my train. I'm in charge of this one, especially if you've got an ego as big as mine. I was walking down giving the right away. There was one brilliant moment um, last year. Apparently there was this one kid who said to one of the booking staff, um, I was chatting with him on the way back up on my return to Carnarvon, and he said, someone came to me and he said, there's a man on that train with a flag and a hat and he looked just like the man in Polo Express. And I was thinking to myself, yes, this is the look I've been trying to go for so many years now. And it's little things like that, I mean. <laughs> Living out your Tom Hanks fantasy. Oh, definitely, definitely. What was the most challenging part about it? Normally, it's trying to deal with something when something goes wrong. It's normally all right if you're on a train, if something else goes wrong, because there's other people kind of dealing with it and you're just doing as you're told. But if there's occasionally, there's a, we do have quite a lot of people, they get on the wrong train. It's the only challenge with having a, being in Port Maddock when you've got two trains going different directions. And Port Maddock Station, there's actually three stations in Port Maddock. There's R1, there's um, the Network Rail one, and there's the Welsh Highland Heritage Railway. So occasionally we get people coming to the wrong place, but normally we pick that up. Yeah, it's normally when a passenger has a complaint about something, or um, there's a delay, and we're stuck in the middle of nowhere, and they've got a connection to a catch, but most of the time we can sort that out. I don't think I've had any really hard breakdowns yet. What would be your advice to people who might be a bit concerned about having to deal with people who are upset or angry? Stay calm, smile, reassure them. Most of the time, if you just chat to them, they can tell you're human. And if you just reassure them that you're doing everything you can to try and get them out of this, they're normally quite understanding. I haven't had anyone kind of kick off saying, why isn't this train moving? Then again, I haven't been on that many failed trains. And if someone wanted to do this kind of job and follow in your footsteps, what would you recommend to them? It depends how you want to do it. I mean, I started really as um, on the loco side, kind of, wanting to get, get on engines and I sort of gained, came into guarding by accident so it literally depends on how you want to do it if you like talking to people if you like like kind of managing busy timetables it sounds kind of boring when you say guarding or you're just walking up and down checking tickets but there's a lot to it things like um route knowledge as well so I've got to know on the Festiniog there's 130 route names all in Welsh and you've got to know exactly where you are at any point in time in case something happens same on the Welsh Island as well so it literally depends on what you like. If you were to do it again, would there be anything you'd do differently? I'd probably try and go into gardening straight away. Mainly because um, I'm with local on a couple of other railways. So my initial thought of getting into gardening is thought I can do local on one other railway and do gardening on this and have a nice variety of stuff. But I'm, I'm happy how it's panned out. So, Will, if people want to find you online and see what you've been up to on the Festin Young Welsh Highland Railways, where should they find you? Uh, most of the time I post stuff I do every day um, on uh, Instagram, so I'm under the things you see. Most days I try and take a, some sort of picture because it's just stunning landscapes. So, yeah. And also any time I take, put a drone video up, I normally link it through there as well uh, to my YouTube channel. And we've used uh, several of your drone videos on the podcast already, which has been great. Thank you very much for them. No worries, no worries. Like say, stunning trains, stunning landscape. And occasional things. So um, uh, about a month ago, I took it down a mine. And so we did some filming down there, which was, that was good fun, actually. Uh, it was absolute pain to film because um, the stabilisation works. It has two little cameras that are pointing down. And so it needs to be able to see the ground so it can stabilise. Uh, obviously, in a, in a mine, when you're about at least 300 foot below the land, it's uh, quite challenging to get light. So, But no, it, it was good fun. We got some nice shots out of that eventually. Exploring Welsh heritage. Oh, definitely. You were the guard at a special event recently. What was that? Uh, that was the uh, Carnarvon Station opening, or the official opening. So for us, we chartered a special train we made up. So we have a, we currently have two first classes on the Welsh Island, uh, on observation car, uh, Glaslin, 
uh, and Botsgachen, which is um, on the other set. Uh, so we, um, the last thing in the evening, um, we took it off the first set in Port Maddox, sent it up to um, Dinas. And our special train it was uh, going to go to from Dinas down to Carnarvon um, to do the big station opening in kind of speeches. And then off to Weinbauer to open that new station building as well, which they just finished. And it was brilliant. We had lots of people, quite a few VIPs. I mean, we had a uh, Lord Daffith Wigley as well, all down there, along with our society, IT chairmans. Uh, it was just a brilliant event, quite different compared to what I'm usually doing. Um, there was no kind of running through tickets, please, or can I put this buggy here kind of thing. It was just being smiley, happy. The same standard guard duties, kind of making sure everything's safe. Um, thankfully, nothing bad happened, but if anything did it happen, um, it would still be me that takes control. Um, so yeah, it's just a lovely, relaxed sort of day. Did you feel any pressure to perform that day? My main pressure was that, A, my uniform looked alright because I was representing the railway, and also that the train ran on time. But then again, there wasn't really much of a timetable either. But no, we had no complaints, everyone was happy, and it, yeah, it was, a, it was just a really good day at work, and I was paid for the privilege, so I am not complaining. <laughs> You're now leaving permanent employment with steam railways, but will you still come back to it? Oh, definitely, yes. I think I found a sort of my second home in Wales, so... It's a shame I'm going to have to leave it for a few months to do my training for my new job, but I'm going to be back as soon as possible. Great stuff. Um, well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's been a pleasure having you. Thanks for having me. Once again, thanks so much to Will for coming on the show. If you want to check out his Instagram, the name again is at the underscore things underscore you underscore C. And it's fantastic, full of great stuff. Likewise, if you want to check us out on social media, the handle on Instagram is at Railway Mania. On Twitter, it's at Railway Mania Net. And we also have a Facebook page. On top of that, the YouTube channel has plenty of videos, including the podcasts, which are often presented in an extended deluxe edition with images and video to go along with the audio, as well as videos on other railway topics, such as model railways and videos from real life railways including tutorials and how-tos, I'm planning to expand the channel, so please do subscribe and turn on notifications. Once again, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Thanks so much for listening. Stay tuned for more Railway Mania soon.